This is an audio sermon recorded at the Church of Christ at Johnson Mill in Fayetteville, Arkansas. We are Christians seeking to worship God in spirit and in truth according to the New Testament. Come worship with us Sunday mornings at 1030 at 3801 Johnson Mill Boulevard. So I'm going to talk about baptism. I want to talk about some things that uh, we need to know before baptism, before we are baptized. I'll talk about some things that happen during baptism. And then I want to talk about the things that, that need to occur after baptism. So things before, during, and after baptism will be the, the study that we'll do today. You have your charts. If anybody needs one, raise a hand. The scriptures are all on the front. They're typed out, and I'll have to direct you to the different locations on the charts. But I'm starting in the little narrow center column for those first four verses that we'll study. And We introduce our thoughts this morning from Mark 16, verse 15 and 16, what what we call the Great Commission. And in that commission, Mark says this of Jesus, And He said unto them, Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned or condemned. So Jesus said to preach the gospel to every creature. What is the gospel? The word gospel means good news, good news. And the gospel is good news, but what is the good news? What is the good news? 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1 to 4, Paul tells us what the gospel, the good news, actually is. He told the Corinthians, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. So Paul said when he preached the gospel, the good news, it was how that Christ died for our sins, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day. Look at the top picture there on the left, and it pictures the gospel. And you'll see there 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3. I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. That's the good news. That we don't have to die for our own sins. Christ died for our sins. Not only died, but was buried And not only was buried, but the Bible says that He rose again the third day, guaranteeing not only the forgiveness of our sins through the shedding of His blood and by His death, but also giving us hope of a resurrection one day, because all of us are going to die. And the good news is we're not going to stay dead. We may be laid in a cemetery somewhere, but one day when Jesus comes again because He conquered death, we will rise from the dead, and we will live again. And this life here is not all there is to it. And this is good news. Where else can we ever find hope of ever living again once we die other than through the gospel? Where would we go to get that news? Where would we go to get that assurance and that hope? Nowhere but Jesus. Nowhere but through the gospel. This is the best news this earth's ever had. Where can we go here on earth, or where can we go anywhere in this universe to get the forgiveness of the sins that we've committed in the past? One person, and that's Jesus. He died for our sins. Who's going to pay our sin debt but Christ? No one. And this is the good news that we preach. And Jesus said, go into all the world and preach this gospel, this good news to every creature, because every person on earth needs to hear this. They need to know that Jesus died for their sins and that He was buried and that He rose again the third day. He said, you go preach that to every creature. And he who will believe that, believe this gospel, and be baptized, I will save that person. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. That's what Rick's going to do today. He believes that. And he's going to be baptized today, and when he does, the Lord's going to save him and forgive all of his sins. But this is done through the gospel. Now, the gospel has to be believed, and it's got facts. You know, uh, we believe facts, and we obey commandments. The gospel has facts to be believed, and it has commandments to be obeyed. 
The facts are the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Those are the things we believe. But the Bible talks about obeying the gospel. You know, I went for years in my life, I had never heard the term obey the gospel. The churches that I was raised up in never used that term. I never heard that term preached before. I attended a congregation of the Church of Christ, and I heard a preacher talk about obeying the gospel, and he said things about obeying the truth, and I've never heard those terms. Obey the truth, what's he talking about here? Obey the gospel, what does he mean by that? I never had heard those terms. And a lot of people haven't, but they're biblical terms. Romans 10 and 16, Paul there quotes Isaiah and says, But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Esaias, or Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? He talks here about obeying the gospel. Now, <clears throat> we know what the gospel is. It's the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. How do you obey that? Jesus died for our sins. Jesus was buried. Jesus rose again the third day. I understand that, we're to believe that, but how do you obey that? How do we die? How are we buried? How are we to rise again? And the answer is through baptism. God has appointed baptism as a means of our obedience to the gospel so that we can express our faith in the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And Paul teaches this in Romans 6, if you'll notice there in the bottom center. Romans 6, verse 3 to 7. He says, Know ye not that so many of us, as were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into His death. Therefore we are buried with Him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of His death, we shall be also in the likeness of His resurrection knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. So in baptism we obey a likeness of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. It's pictured here in the second picture, here on the left side. A picture of the gospel is on the top, and then how to obey the gospel. We believe the gospel by believing the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, and we obey the gospel in baptism. And in baptism, Paul said, we are baptized into His death. Notice the picture there on the left. We actually die with Jesus. In baptism, we are baptized into His death. Our old man is crucified with Him. The old person we were has got to die. Just as Jesus died, we die with Him. So we're baptized into His death, and the old person that we were is put to death. It dies. The old sinful person is just no good. It's got to die. It's got to be put to death. And so we are crucified with Jesus in baptism. We're baptized into His death. The Bible says here that we're buried with Him by baptism into death, that the body of our sins might be destroyed. So in baptism, sin is destroyed because we reach there the saving blood of Jesus that He shed in His death, and we're baptized into that death. And then He says that we're raised up to walk in newness of life, just as Christ was resurrected, we have a resurrection. And so God has appointed baptism, and for this reason, He's asked us, commanded us, to believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And He wants us to demonstrate the fact that we believe that. And so he appointed the act of baptism. And in essence, he's saying to everybody, do you believe that Jesus died for your sins? Then will you be baptized into his death? Will you be baptized with him into death? Do you believe that Jesus was buried? Then will you be buried with him by baptism into death? That's why baptism can't be a sprinkling. A sprinkling or pouring of water is not a likeness of a burial. Immersion is the likeness of Christ's burial because Christ was buried, and baptism is a burial. And you cannot express faith in the burial of Jesus by having sprinkling because you're not demonstrating a burial, see. You've got to be buried with Him. And in baptism, we're told that we're buried with Him by baptism into death. And then He's, uh, just as Jesus was raised up to walk in newness of life, 
when we're raised up out of the water, we're raised up with Christ to start a new life, you see. The old life that we've been living has now been put to death. The old person we were has died. It's been buried. And the new person that's been born again rises from that watery grave and begins a brand new life. And this is called obeying the gospel, obeying the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And it's a very beautiful thing. So that's what will be done this afternoon when we witness this baptism. Ricky will be baptized into Christ. He will die with Jesus. The old man that he is will be put to death, will be crucified and destroyed. He will be buried with the Lord and he will rise from that water, a new creation in Christ to walk a new and different life. And that's what happens in the act of baptism. And these are things that we need to understand and know before we're baptized. We reach the saving blood of Jesus in the act of baptism. Now, notice down in the bottom left that when you and I are baptized, we are baptized into Christ. And that's Galatians 3, verse 26 and 27. We need to be in Christ because there are blessings there. But when, when we're baptized, that's really when we enter into Christ. Paul said in Galatians 3, 26, 27, for ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. So how do we get into Christ? The Bible talks about being in Christ, blessings that are in Christ. How do we get into Christ? We read a moment ago in Romans 6 over there, verse 3, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into His death. Now in Galatians 3, we read here that for as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. So it's in baptism that we get into Christ. And it's important to be in Christ. Let me illustrate that with this coat that I'm wearing this morning. <clears throat> you know, you can go to the store and you can buy your jacket, buy a suit, whatever, buy your coat. And you may like that coat when you buy it and you may think, hey, that looks pretty sharp and, and I like that real well. You can take it home and hang it up in your closet. Every now and then you can get that garment down and look at it and say, boy, that thing looks good. But you know what? It's not doing you any good there in the closet. Not doing one bit of good. And it won't do you any good till you put it on. You've got to get into that jacket, see. And that's how it is with Jesus. You can talk about Him all day. You can say, I believe in the Lord. I think He was a wonderful man. Oh yeah, I read where he did this or that and you know he's very interesting. You can be fascinated with Jesus, but he won't do you any good till you put him on. <clears throat> and you've got to get into Christ to put him on. And so the Bible says you're all the children of God <clears throat> by faith in Christ Jesus, for as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. So we put him on in the act of baptism. Now what does it mean to put on Christ? To put on His likeness, to be like Him, to wear Him, to be holy as He was, to be righteous like Him, to be merciful and compassionate as He was, to be loving and giving like Jesus. It's to put on the nature of Jesus. It's to become like Christ, to act like Him, to think like Him, to walk like Him, to talk like Him, to be like Jesus. And we do that in baptism. We put Him on and we, we wear Him. We try to portray Him to the world, to live as He would live, see. We have put on Christ. We put off the old man, and we put on the new man, and we put on Jesus Christ. And notice from the diagram there in the bottom left that we're baptized into Christ. Now there's great blessings found in Christ that you can't have anywhere else. And these blessings are so wonderful that you don't, uh, you don't have to have any money to buy them. In fact, the richest man on earth can't purchase them. But the poorest man on earth can have them. They're free to anybody that will obey the Lord. And when we're baptized into Christ and we abide in Jesus, there are things in Christ that are not found anywhere else. Read the Scriptures out to the side, 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 17. Paul said, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away, Behold, all things are become new. So when we're in Jesus Christ, we are a new creature. Some translations say a new creation. 
we're a new creation, a new creature. And so there are a lot of people that say, you know, I, I would like to have a new start in life if I, could, if I could just go back and start my life over. That's really what God's offering. God says, I'll give you a second chance. You've messed up your life, I'll give you a new life. I'll make you a new creation. I'll forgive everything you've done in the past, everything you've said, done, or thought that was contrary to my laws, I will forgive that freely. And I'll make a new person out of you, and I'll make a new creature out of you. And I'll give you new hopes, and I'll give you new dreams, and aspirations, and goals. And I'll give you a brand new start, a brand new life. And you can be born again and have a birth and start life over. That's what God's offering you, a second chance. Isn't that wonderful? And if you're in Christ, the Bible says you're a new creature, a new creation. That's one of the blessings. You get a brand new start. Secondly, in Ephesians 1 and 3, the Bible says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Every one of God's spiritual blessings, notice there, all spiritual blessings are found where? In Christ. They're not found outside of Christ. So if you haven't been baptized into Christ, you don't have these things. But every spiritual blessing that God has for His children is found in Jesus Christ. That's why we need to be baptized into Him. Well, what blessings are we talking about? Righteousness, peace, joy, hope, comfort, strength, encouragement, any, any spiritual blessing, forgiveness, anything you can, um, can think of that God gives His children is found in Jesus Christ, and they're not anywhere else. And the poorest person on earth can have every one of those blessings. You can't buy them no matter how wealthy you are. But when you're baptized into Jesus Christ, you can enjoy every one of them because that's where they're found. And that's why we need to obey the gospel and be baptized. See? Because in Christ we are blessed with all spiritual blessings. Notice Romans 8 and 1. The Bible says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. If you're in Christ today, you're free from all condemnation. No one can condemn you for anything you've ever said, thought, or done. The devil can appear before God and, and say to God himself, I remember the time so-and-so said this, or thought this, or did this. And when we're in Christ, and God's forgiven of those, given those sins, there is no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. We are completely free from condemnation. Isn't that a great blessing? So it doesn't matter what the past has been. That's all forgiven. That's all forgiven. And there is no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Finally, in Ephesians 1 and 7, he speaks of this blessing in Christ. Speaking of Christ, he says, In whom, speaking of Jesus, In whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of His grace. So if you're in Christ today, you have redemption through His blood. You've been bought with the blood of Jesus Christ. You've been a slave to sin. The Lord has bought you with His blood and made you free. You've been redeemed bought back, purchased, and now you belong to God. We have redemption through His blood, and He said the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. All of our sin is wiped out and forgiven, and when God forgives that, He remembers that sin no more against us. So when we stand before the Lord on the day of judgment, those sins will not come up in remembrance. Now, we know that they've been committed, and God knows that they were committed. But they are forgotten insofar as being reckoned to our account. We will, not, we will not have to pay for those, because they've been paid for by Jesus. And there is redemption through His blood and the forgiveness of sins. Look at those things there in Christ. You see, when you're baptized, and you really believe in Jesus, when you have faith in Christ, and are baptized into Christ, and put on Christ, then in Christ you are a new creature. You are blessed with all spiritual blessings in Christ. 
There is no condemnation. You have redemption through the blood and the forgiveness of your sins. What a great, what a great blessing this is to obey this gospel. And that's what happens in the act of baptism. Now, baptism is the transition from an old life into a new life. And so after we've made that transmission into this new life, and God has delivered us from our sins, there is a life to be lived. We have been saved from all of our past sins, but not future sins. See. And so there's a life to be lived in order to be kept within the grace of God. We've got to walk with the Lord. We've got to obey the Lord. And there's some things that you and I need to remember when we've been saved, and those are things there on the right, and I want to talk about at least seven things here that I want to remind us of. And this will be true for Ricky today, but it's true of all of us. And if you have desires here today to become a Christian, then you need to pay attention to these because this is what the Christian life is about. And these will be things that, that you'll need to remember. And if you've recently been baptized, as some here have, then you need to remember these things as well. First of all, you need to remember that you are a new creature. And we talked about that a moment ago. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. So you need to understand that if when you're baptized into Christ, you have a new beginning. You're a new creation. And you should think differently than you used to think. You need to talk differently than how you talked. Your speech needs to be pleasing to God and right. And then you need, to, you need to act like everything is new, and you need to live like you have a new life. God wants us then to think and to speak and to act and to live differently as Christians. We will have different goals and dreams and aspirations and hopes. There is a whole new life, and we should live a completely different life than what we've lived before. In Christ you are a new creation. God has given you a new start, and so we need to live a new life. Secondly, you start out a babe in Christ. You know, when we have a physical birth and we come into this world, we don't start out as an adult, do we? We start out as a little baby, like we hear one crying there now, and they're sweet, and we don't mind to hear babies in the assembly, by the way. It's a, it's a noise we welcome. It's a sign that there's there's going to be people around for a while when we hear babies. So we love to see babies in, in the assembly, and we don't mind them crying either. Uh, but we start out a babe in Christ, 1 Peter 2 and 2. <clears throat> Peter said, As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the Word that you may grow thereby. So let's understand when we're first baptized, we start out as a babe. We really do. And there's, uh, there's certain food that you feed babies. You don't feed a baby steak. They're not ready for strong meat and things like this. We have to watch their diet. And so we give them milk and then eventually a little softer food as they can take that. And, and then they learn to eat stronger things. And that's how the Christian life is. Don't jump off in the book of Revelation right off. Don't get into difficult things. Drink the milk of the Word for a while. And that'll, that'll start you on a system of growth. And that'll give you the foundation and the background that you need. And just remember, you're a babe. Also remember that when we're babies, we can't do everything that we can do as adults. And so we, won't, we just won't live this life perfectly all the time. We will make mistakes. And there are just things that we'll have, we won't have the judgment that we'd like to have for a while. We won't have the, the, the experience and the wisdom and the knowledge that we will gain eventually as we grow, just as we do in our physical life. And so there's limitations on babies. Don't, don't get upset because you can't do this or, or that like somebody else can. Just understand, I'm in a growth process here. And I don't care if you're 60 years old, if you've been baptized into Christ, you're a babe. That's just how it is. If you're 16, you're a babe, whatever, whatever the age is. We just start out as a babe in Christ, and grow thereby. And so you're going to need food, and the Bible says, desire the sincere milk of the Word. Get in the Bible. 
and study. There's a, there's a lot of people that never develop as a Christian. They remain babes. They just do. And they may be 60 or 70 years old and still a baby. I've always thought it would be interesting if, uh, if our spiritual age could be reflected in our physical appearance. Wouldn't that be an interesting thing? To look at the congregation this morning in terms of our spiritual age by how we would look physically. You might see a 60-year-old that's in diapers, you know, because that 60-year-old is a babe. See. You might see a 25-year-old that looks 45 or 50 or older. And that would be interesting to see that reflected in our physical age. So just because somebody looks older physically and everything, that's no sign that that's how they are spiritually. And so we need to cut each other slack and realize where we may be spiritually. That even though we're older in life, we don't have sometimes experience and judgment and wisdom that we will have as we grow as Christians. As newborn babes, Desire the sincere milk of the Word that you may grow thereby. Number three, when you come into Christ, it's a critical period. You're, you're going to be tempted, and everybody is. 1 Corinthians 10 and 13, the Bible says, there, there hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you're able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. Yes, we're going to be tempted. But God will not allow us to be tempted above what we're able to bear. And uh, he says that there'll always be a way to escape that temptation. That doesn't mean we'll take it, but it means it's there. The problem is we don't always take that way of escape, do we? God gives us a way of escape. He doesn't put too much on us. But sometimes we don't take that route out. We don't escape temptation. We give in and we sin. And you're going to do that at times. Get back up in the fight when you do. When you get knocked down by the devil, get back up in the ring, just like a boxer. Get the gloves up and get back in the fight. That's all you've got to do. You're going to get knocked down. You're going to get jabbed here and there. You're going to, he's going to land a blow here or there. We're not going to do this perfectly. We have our weaknesses, and the devil knows where those spots are. And so he's going to get to us at times. But he doesn't have to knock us out of the fight. And so just get up with the gloves back on and start landing the punches. And start living the life. And when you get knocked down, why well, don't get, just don't get bent out of shape. Well, I blew that. I should have known better than that. Of course you should have. We can all say that. But get back up and get in the fight. And we'll be merciful, and we'll be tender with each other, and we'll be compassionate. And we'll help each other through these fights and these losses that we suffer. And the Lord will help us as we repent and come to Him. He's always merciful and willing to forgive us. And uh, so you have great help from the Lord and from brothers and sisters in Christ. See? Just understand it's a critical time. Number four, understand that you can fall away. There's countless hundreds and thousands of people that have been baptized that are no longer in the church. They have quit. They quit walking. They quit attending church. They uh, go back to the ways of the world, and they, they fall away from grace, and we can fall. In 1 Corinthians 10 and 12, the Bible says, Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed, lest he fall. Now that warning is in the Bible for a purpose. If we can't fall from grace, this is a useless warning. But Paul said, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed, lest he fall. And then we read in Galatians 5, verse 1 to 4, of Christians who did fall. Paul tells them, stand fast therefore in the liberty, wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if you be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. Christ is become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. 
These Galatians had left the gospel and the mercy and grace of God and had gone back to circumcision and trying to keep Moses' law to be justified. And Paul said when they did that, they fell from grace. You see, we can go back to an old lifestyle as well, back to the ways of the world. And that's what some people do as Christians. They, they obey and they come out of the waters of baptism joyful, happy, seemingly committed to the Lord. Before long they start drifting away. Church services begin to be less frequent that they attend. They don't read as they should. They, they fail to pray. Uh, they don't surround themselves with Christian association. They begin running with the wrong crowd and wrong people. And those lifestyles that they see around them have an impact upon them and an influence. The Bible says that evil communications corrupt good manners. And so you can run with the wrong crowd. But if we will come to church when it assembles and read our Bibles and study and meditate in the Word and we'll have an active prayer life, and if we will associate with Christian people, like-minded people that will encourage us and be good influence, we can live the Christian life. It's really, it's, it's, it's a hard life in some ways, but we make it harder by just failing to do simple things. Christianity is, is, is kind of like football. It's made up of simple things. You know, if you want to play football, you've got to block and you've got to tackle <coughs> and kick and things like that. It's, there's just fundamentals, we call it, mainly blocking and tackling. If you want to live the Christian life, there's just fundamentals. You go to church. You pray. You read and study. Fundamentals. And uh, so don't forget these things. You can fall away and be lost. Number five, you will be persecuted as a Christian. When you try to live the Christian life, you're going to be persecuted. In 2 Timothy 3 and 12, Paul said, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. When you try to do right, there are people going to, they're going to mock. They're going to make fun of you. They're going to ridicule you. They're going to think you're narrow-minded because you don't do this or that or say this or that, because you don't believe this or that. And when they ask you things and you point out what the Bible teaches, they're going to think you're weird. They're going to think that you're an oddball, a kook. And so they'll make fun of you sometimes and laugh at you and ridicule you. That's all right. They ridiculed our Lord, didn't they? They reviled Jesus, the greatest life ever lived. And if they reviled our Lord and persecuted Him, can we expect less? They'll certainly persecute us because we don't have the perfection that he did, and yet he still suffered persecution. Don't worry about being teased. Don't worry about being mocked or ridiculed. Stand up for the Lord, and you may win these people that are reviling you. After all, that's what the Lord did for us. You know, Jesus was scorned and reviled and ridiculed, and he went to the cross for the very people that were doing that, and later when the gospel was preached, some of those that were consenting to his death like that obeyed his gospel and became Christians. And that's our job, is to win even our enemies to the Lord. See? And that's why we need to put on Christ and, and be like Christ. You will be persecuted. Number six, remember also when you become a new Christian or are a Christian, Christ is your example. Don't follow me. I'm not a real good example. I'll let you down. Don't follow any person. We are not perfect examples. But Jesus is. And He's the one you need to look to. When you look at your Bible in Hebrews chapter 11, the Bible gives a uh, long list of men and women of faith. It's the great chapter on faith. And it talks about Abel and Noah and Abraham, and Isaac, and Jacob, and Joseph, and Sarah, and it names all kinds of people that, that lived a godly life, that ran the race of life, and were successful because they had faith and they obeyed God. And I want you to picture, if you will, a racetrack, an arena, uh, and you've got grandstands, and you've got people sitting in those stands, and in those stands 
is Abel and Noah and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Sarah and Joseph and others, all that have run this race that you're running now, and they're sitting up there in the bleachers and they're victors. And they are witnesses to the fact that this race can be run successfully. And Jesus has run this race. He came here to earth and lived a perfect life. And he has proven that a person can live for the Lord and live the right kind of life and be victorious. See? Now picture yourself on the racetrack of life, and you're running your race right now. All of us are. And in the stands are Jesus and all these other witnesses. Now read Hebrews 12 with me with that, with that picture in your mind. The Bible says, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. There they are. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before Him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down on the right hand of the throne of God. For consider Him that endured such contradiction of sinners against Himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds, ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. Not a one of us has shed a drop of blood trying to live the Christian life and strive against sin. Jesus did, and a lot of the people we read of in Scripture did. Some of them gave up their life. They gave a lot of blood. He said, ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. It hasn't cost us very much yet, has it? But we're in this race, and as you run your race, as you live your life, look to Jesus and just ask yourself, what would the Lord do here? I've had this person hurt me deeply. They've said or done things. What would the Lord do here? Wouldn't He have compassion? Did He not say, love your enemies? Bless them that persecute you. Do good to them that hate you. Pray for them that despitefully use you. See? And just ask yourself as you run this race, what would Christ do here? And look to Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith. You can live the Christian life. Okay? Finally, the last thing I want to mention is that you and I need to remember that we are the salt of the earth and the light of the world. Yes, this little group right here in this area, we are salt and we are light. And that's what Jesus teaches here. Let's, let's read His words, Matthew 5. Verse 13 to 16. Jesus said, Ye are the salt of the earth. But if the salt have lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing, but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. Ye are the light of the world. A city which is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. So the Lord says that we are the light of the world. You know, light, uh, light cheers and comforts, doesn't it? Think about a stormy night when the electricity goes off. What's the first thing we do? Well, we try to get light. When we're up and about and moving around, we don't want to move in darkness. We love light. And light, there's just something comforting and cheerful about light. It gives direction. It illuminates. See, It cheers and comforts and things like this. That's what you and I do out here in this world of darkness. We shine as lights. We are to be the light of the world. We are to cheer people and comfort people and give them hope and give them direction as they look at our lives. Secondly, the Lord says that we're the salt of the earth. Salt's got a lot of uses, a lot of different properties. Uh, one thing salt does, it, it seasons and flavors things, <coughs> makes them taste better. And uh, you'll find that where Christians are around and about in, in groups and everything. There's a 
they kind of flavor things. They kind of season it and give it a, a lot better setting and, and uh, uh, atmosphere than what it would otherwise be. Salt does that. It seasons and flavors, makes things better. Salt does another thing. Our, our ancestors used to preserve meat with salt. They would salt their meat and to preserve it. And I think, uh, I think this nation, to a large extent, has been preserved by Christian people, by godly people. Wasn't that true at the uh, destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah when Abraham pleaded with God? God came down and told Abraham, I'm about to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah for their sins. And Abraham pleaded with God. He had a nephew, Lot, that was there. And Abraham loved these people, and he was worried about them. And he, he told the Lord, if you find 50 righteous, will you spare those cities? The Lord said, I'll do it for 50. Abraham said, if you find 40, would you still spare them? God said, I'll do it for 40. Abraham kept bargaining. If you find 30 righteous there, Lord, will you preserve this city? Will you, will you not destroy them? He said, I'll spare them for, for 30. He bargained with him for 20. If you find 20, will you spare them? Yes, I'll spare them for 20. Lord, uh, give me one more chance here. If you find 10 people, Lord, just 10 people in Sodom and Gomorrah, will you save those cities? The Lord said, I'll spare them for 10. But he couldn't find 10. He found Lot and his wife and two daughters. He found four. And one of them looked back and became a pillar of salt. But you see, righteous people, had there been enough of them in those wicked cities, as bad as they were, they would have preserved those cities. And that's what salt does. And I'm satisfied that a lot of the blessings that have come upon this country, upon our communities and different things, are brought on us by Christian people. Can you imagine our society if it didn't have Christian people in it? Can you imagine if there were no Christian values in this nation, what it would be like? We're seeing that more and more, aren't we? We're getting a picture of what it's like without Christian influence, without this salt being there, see? Because salt, salt uh, seasons things and preserves them. Let me tell you something else that salt does. Makes you thirsty. And that's what you and I are supposed to do. We're supposed to live our life in such a way that we make people thirsty. Thirsty for what we have. Thirsty for the Lord, see. Make them thirst. Make them hunger and thirst for righteousness, see. And salt will do that. Salt will make you thirsty. And so live your life in such a way that when people look around at you, they'll say, boy, I'd, I'd, I'd really like to have what that person has. I'm thirsty for that. I want to be like that. Here's something else that salt does. It stings. You ever got it in your eyes or in a wound? Yeah. It kind of stings, doesn't it? That's what we're to do. We're to sting people. And I don't mean we go around trying to torture people and punish them. Our life ought to be lived in a way that it stings them because of how they're living. That... Uh, this life that we're living when it gets in their wounds stings and makes them uncomfortable. Our lives not only ought to make people thirsty, but they ought to make them uncomfortable with how they're living, and it stings them. And that's why a lot of times people get mad at Christians. They persecute them and lash out at them because their life is a rebuke to the life that these other people are living, and it stings. And yet we're to be salt, and that's one of the things that salt does. Salt seasons, it preserves. Salt will uh, make a person thirsty. Salt will sting. We're to be all those things to people that are about us. So as we're baptized into Christ, let's remember this. We become a new creature. We have all spiritual blessings. There's no condemnation. We have redemption through His blood and forgiveness. We are a new creation. We are a babe in Christ. It is a critical period. We can fall away. We will be persecuted. Jesus is our example. And we are the salt of the earth and the light of the world. And these are things that ought to be 
remembered always by all of us. The lesson's yours this morning. I hope it's been useful to us. I hope, uh, Rick, this has given you some insight into what you're getting into today. And we're thankful that you're going to obey. There might be somebody else or maybe several somebodies here today that would, would like to obey the Lord in baptism today. And now you kind of know what it's about and what it's for. And if you've got faith in Jesus and His death, burial, and resurrection, and you need forgiveness of your sins, and you want these blessings that are found in Christ, and you want to put on Christ, and you want to begin living this life, you can do that if you'll believe the gospel and obey the Lord Jesus Christ. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. If we can help anyone here today, and you need to come at this invitation, we'll ask you to come and have a seat in one of the front chairs as we rise and sing the song that's been selected. We hope you enjoyed this teaching from God's Word. To receive new sermons each week, subscribe on Google Play Music, iTunes, Spotify, and like us on Facebook. Thanks for listening, and God bless.